when spadroons are awesome. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So many people out there will know that I don't like spadroons, but is that actually true and is that accurate? Well, actually, I don't like some spadroons. The 1796 British um, Infantry Officer's Spadroon, or NCO Spadroon, is a horrible design. Um, it's got all sorts of problems with it, but primarily it's to do with the blade. pattern Infantry Officer's Spadroon, British Infantry Officer's Spadroon. And I, I really I've spoken like about this one. precise topic before, but I've got a different example to show of what I believe to be a good Spadroon. But I'm going to caveat that by saying it's not really a spadroon. So what is a spadroon? Well first up, that's a difficult question to answer. A spadroon is a sword that essentially looks somewhat like a large small sword, but that has been given cutting ability for a military purpose. So what you classify as a spadroon is actually quite subjective. Um, the 1796 spadroon has a blade that has attempted to take a thrusting design sword and give it cutting capacity. But in doing so, has wrecked both of those things. It is rubbish at cutting, like so bad that you just just don't try to cut with it. Um, and in trying to change the blade so that you could cut with it, they've made it worse at thrusting. Why is this a good spadroon? If, if indeed we call it a spadroon, which I personally, I'm not sure whether I would or not. Um, why is it good? Because it's a dedicated thruster. It is a stiff blade. First of all, what is it? Well, let's bring it up to the camera so you can have a little look. It is, I believe, an 1816 pattern um, French NCO's sword. And it's actually dated, and let's just look at the section of the blade there. You can see it's got a thick mid-rib. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, the uh, model 1816 NCO's sword, epée, they're actually quite in France, which means sword, um, is uh, essentially, it's, I would describe it as a, co uh, a kind of a militarised small sword. Okay, so why is it militarised? What makes it militarised compared to a normal small sword? Well, first of all, the hilt is larger, there's no finger rings, the hilt's more robust, and the blade is more robust. Um, and not only is the blade more robust, it is double-edged and really stiff. Now, a normal small sword blade is stiff, but it's um, lighter than this. This is a heavier sword. This weighs not as much as, a, as an infantry officer's sabre, um, but it's um, hev definitely heavier than most small swords that I've ever held. Okay, so it's, um, it's heavier. Why is heavier gooder? Well, in one sense, it means it's more robust. There's more metal in it. It's more likely to be able to sustain rough combat, hitting against mu muskets and um, penetrating through uh, thick, you know, military clothing, winter clothing, this kind of stuff. It's more likely to be able to sustain that type of brutal uh, use. But equally, in terms of defending, that's a good thing because one of the one of the flaws with the small sword compared to other weapons is that it's very light and when you're using a very light weapon it's great that it's quick but it's very difficult to parry certain types of heavier weapon. If someone swings a, a cavalry um, broadsword or a, or a sabre at you, palash at you, then it can be difficult if you catch it in the wrong part of the blade to parry if your blade is really super light. In this case we've got a bit more mass in the blade and in the hilt, so the overall weapon is heavier, you're more likely to be able to get a good solid guard or parry in against a musket or a sabre or broadsword or whatever. Um, as well as being simplified and more robust, the hilt is also larger, which has two benefits. Number one, you can get a more secure grip on it. It still has a rectangular grip, incidentally, so you can still, you can hold it with a thumb up grip. You can't hold it really in the small sword grip because you don't have any finger ring to rest your index finger against. But you can hold it a thumb up grip which achieves a similar, similar ends. But importantly, the guard is more robust. Now that's another flaw of the small sword against other swords, for example, is that the guard is very small and not very strong very often. Some are. I've shown an example before which had a strong guard. Um, but clearly, if you're trying to defend against someone who's trying to hit you with a, with a sabre or a palash, often the blow will come down the blade and um, hit the guard, at least partially. So you want a larger guard and a stronger guard, and that's exactly what this has. So, larger guard, stronger guard, longer, bigger hilt, easier, more secure to grasp against heavy blows. And finally, the blade. The blade is 
slightly beefier, slightly bigger than a small sword blade is, and it is really quite stiff. I was going to push it into my hand then, that would have made an interesting bloody video. Um, so I won't push it into my hand, because I've just been doing a video with blunt swords where I was pushing it into my hand. Um, but with a sharp sword, here we go. Um, so you see I can flex it, but it's really stiff. Now, it does, interestingly, have an edge, which is part of the reason why I would say it is a spadroon. The other part of the reason why I'd say it's a spadroon is because it's clearly militarised, and swords with this style of hilt tend to get called spadroons to differentiate them from a small sword. You wouldn't really call this a small sword because it's not small and it's not for dueling, it's not a gentleman's sidearm. Additionally, this is made for an NCO. What's an NCO? I guess most of you know, non-commissioned officer. That means corporals and sergeants, people who've joined as a private soldier and risen up through being good at their job, risen up um, to that level to essentially be, it's like being a um, it's the level between officers and privates, essentially. And very often the NCOs are the most experienced and the most useful uh, members of, of the military. Um, the officers, at least in this period, not so much in France actually, but in Britain, had often purchased their rank so they would buy their way into the, into the military. You'd have to go in still at the lowest level, but then they would gradually, once they'd done the requisite amount of time, buy their way up the ranks. In fact, France had a different system, and in France you did actually have to do qualifications, as we do now in the British Army, incidentally, um, but we were a bit behind the curve as, as far as I was concerned. But NCO's uh, sword, and this incidentally, yes, if you're thinking, if you know about American swords, and you're thinking, that looks really familiar, I'm sure I've sort of seen that in an American Civil War film or something. Indeed, as I've mentioned before, American swords, many of them, most of them, almost all of them, are copies of French swords. And there is an 1840 um, NCO's sword that was carried in the American Civil War, and obviously from 1840 onwards, that is based on this sword, but with an important difference. Many models of this sword in France, and then all of the American ones, do not have this type of blade. And ironically, what type of blade do they have? They have one that's like the British 1796 Spadroon, which is a rubbish blade. They, they've made the exact same mistake that the British made in 1796 by trying to give a blade... It's as good at thrusting as a small sword, and nowhere near as good at cutting as a sabre or a broadsword. Um, so what they made was a weapon that was essentially a bit rubbish, and I'm not a fan of spadroons as you may be give a blade that can cut. They shouldn't have done that. This is a fantastic blade. Now, why is this such a good blade? Because they've gone, hell, let's just make a good thrusting blade. Who cares about cutting? And, and in this situation, I'm not saying that all blades should be dedicated cutters or dedicated thrusters. You can make a good compromised blade, but not at spadroon width. If a blade is only the same width as, as this, you can't make it into a good cutter, so why try? If you want to make a sword that's that narrow, Make it a dedicated thrusting sword, because then you can make a good sword. You cannot make a good cutting sword that is that narrow, I assert. Some people may disagree with me. Feel free to comment below. Um, and while I mention that, I will yet again mention, please check that you're subscribed, and please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching the video. Um, I hugely appreciate the subscribers I get, and I am aware that some people get auto-unsubscribed for some reason on, on YouTube. Yet again, it's been reported to me by people it's happened to. I have had it happen to me. So please do subscribe. Um, and um, just to finish off really, so this is a good spadroon. Um, I call it a spadroon because it's militarized and because it's bigger than a small sword and it's meant for a, for a military um, NCO. Um, and why is it good? Because it's good at thrusting. It's good at something and it's better to be good at something than good at nothing. Um, and finally also, the more robust and larger hilt. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, 
You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.